some of the... Re oh, by the way, who has to have the recovery unit? Company. Company. Does it have to be one on every service truck? No. No. It's nice to have it on every service truck. <laughs> Instead of having to run back to the shop and get it, but only one recovery unit is required for the company. But that's not usually the way they operate. But, but it's they, practical to have one on every truck until you have like to I think so, <laughs> especially at the price of gasoline. You're right. <laughs> yeah, or even diesel. <laughs> yeah, it depends on what kind of vehicle you got. But uh, and and just the the. Uh, the, the comfort of having it there, so to speak, you know. David, you might mention that uh, actually uh, the EPA requires that a company register their recovery machine with them. There's a form they're supposed to fill yes. out and send in. That, that I don't know correct. how many companies do that. That's, but it's... Well, <laughs> I can tell you that when I was working with UGA full-time, we had to. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got audited. So that's... Uh, Something that you want your ducks in a row when it happens. It taught me a lot about record keeping. Uh, I found out that even though you had some systems you're required to keep records on, something that has 50 pounds or more, you have to keep service records on it. You're a whole lot better off to keep records on all the equipment you service that has refrigerants in it. It just it's it's, it's so much easier to keep track of what's going on anyhow. You know, if you got a system out there that has had uh, continuous leaks in it, then that's a, a, a red flag right there. Something's going on. So those things can, and, and y'all know the price of refrigerant's not going to come down. You know, it's it's going to go up and up and up. So uh, managing the refrigerants, that's part of it right there. When you recover refrigerant, the quickest way to recover it is through uh, get, getting the liquid out. Although, you're going to have to get the vapor out too. And if you wind up seeing places on the system with ice or moisture, you haven't got all the refrigerant out yet. When you, when you see something similar, to, I'm going to use try to show this here in the book. You can see that ice forming what looks like to be the accumulator or receiver, don't know which it is, but that's an indication that it still has refrigerant in it there. The refrigerant's boiling off, okay? And if you let that system sit for a few minutes and then recover it again, you will get that out. Okay, and there are certain levels that you must get down to to successfully remove the refrigerants. Um, I'll let you go over that through your book, okay? All right, now we talked about recovering the refrigerants, uh, recycling them. There's one other thing that we haven't covered yet, reclaiming the refrigerants. Okay, we don't do that in the field. Okay, reclaiming the refrigerants is something that is, if you will, done with a manufacturer or a factory type thing, it's to bring the refrigerants back up to a, uh, Rick, you're going to have to help me out here. Do you remember what AIR it AIR 700 standards. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Rick has got a good mind to remember things like that. I wish I did. But uh, we can't do that in the field. Like I said, we can clean it up, we can remove acid, we can remove a certain amount of, uh, of uh, well, we can get the moisture out of it, things like that. But we cannot bring it up to the factory standards, and that's that's what reclaiming is about. Okay, well, it would be nice. I don't know. This is one of those uh, personal things, but one thing I hate to do is leak check the system. So I'm looking for easy ways to do that. Why do I hate to leak check systems? You know, how long does it take? You don't know. <laughs> you get on a system and you know you got a leak. Well, it's kind of like that uh, Easter egg hunt, you may say. If you don't know where the prize eggs is, you, you, you might be there all day long and never find it still. So, I never have enjoyed leak checking, but 
it's a, nece it's a necessity and it is um, <coughs> the only way to truly repair a unit. If you keep adding refrigerant to it, you're just <coughs> fooling yourself and spending it and wasting money and time and refrigerants. So, I'm going to go start off with one of the older methods. You don't see this used very much anymore at all. That's a halide gas leak detector. It actually would hook up to a propane tank. Oh. Ain't gonna open yet. How about that? David, you might mention also that uh, that's why a lot of companies have a flat rate fee for a leak check. It might be three hundred dollars because they don't know how long it's going to it could no. take all day long. Could take all day. That's true. You know. And, and I'll tell you something, when I have had uh, do, to do leak checking, and I'm sure I'll still have to do more in the future, I usually don't just find one leak on a system. I'll usually find it, at least two or three. Okay. This is a uh, halide leak detector. What, what actually happens, I'm not going to look it all up, there's a little plate inside of here that heats up. This is your sniffer. You would look for the leak with that. Now, y'all see a problem here? Now these are still used, but do you see a problem? Yes. Okay. You're going to have a flame, right? Okay. You're also going to have, when you burn that refrigerant, guess what you're making? You could be making phosine gas. That's not good. It's a very dangerous gas. Okay, I'm not going to tell you this don't work. It does, but it's uh, my opinion. It's probably uh, old technology, and some fellows out here would would tell me, uh-uh, that's not true. I do it all the time. Well. Chinese had a good calculator too. <laughs> Plus, you don't want to burn the customer's house down looking right. for a refrigerant leak. That's exactly right. <laughs> so, what's some of the other ways that we can use? How so, about? Yeah, I'm gonna get to that. One. <laughs> How about electronic leak detector? Okay. Sounds off, also has a visual, has a pump. Most of them have a pump that's actually pulling samples into this, this uh, sensor. Now, there are some disadvantages to it. What if it's a windy day and you're on a rooftop? Okay, what's it sound like when it does finally leak? These things can detect a rate of a leak that is equivalent to one half of an ounce a year. That's pretty sensitive. Pretty sensitive. Which brings up another problem. What if you have a large leak and you're trying to find it with this? Okay. Don't get me wrong. It's a great tool. Great tool. But like anything else, it's going to have some limitations. Some of the earlier, in fact, I guess you can still buy them today, earlier systems would actually have to have been plugged up, which is fine if you're close to an appliance outlet, but if you're on the rooftop, sometimes that's not that easy to get a hold of. Now, one of the codes of today is uh, there should be an outlet close to equipment on the roof, but let me tell you, a lot of, a lot of folks out here in the field to tell you they couldn't find one nowhere within a half a mile it seems like you know so here's comes the long drop cord so I love a battery operated but I also like the one that has the pump in it too by the way keep that away from any moisture water if you get water on the sensor there's a good chance that you're going to mess it up now this is a die that would go into the system it rides with the oil, and it is great for finding leaks. It's a, it's a problem here too, though. It's got to circulate through the system before it's going to show up. Okay, so that means that if I put the dye in right now, 
that system's got to run for a while before I'm going to be able to to use the uh, the uh, light as a uh, what they call it. Just, uh, Oh, I can't even think of the name of the type of light. Anyway, ultraviolet. Uh, what's that? Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet light. Has the ultraviolet light that'll show up. There's another problem too. What if you're out in the bright sunlight? Can't see it. Now, some of the older versions, again, you had to have a big old light drop cord. Had to be very powerful. They got them down now to where they're pretty much a, a uh, uh, in a uh, flashlight version. And want to pass that around and just take a look at it. Now I'll tell you from personal experience, if you get that dial in, it don't come off very easy. <laughs> David got a question over here. Yes. With the dial, would you not be able to get more accurate than the other two methods there for a larger system if you're looking at you could find possibly the, the more the, leaks? The, yes. The beauty of the die is once you put it in there, it's in there. So if you have another leak to come up at a later time, you don't have to add more dye to it. And that, that is a, a real plus. The downside of it is most service jobs, when you go out there, you want to try to get everything straightened out right then and there because you're looking at another service trip to go back out again. And that's where the, the, the uh, fluorescent dyes don't do well. Now, Notice I said fluorescent dyes. They make dyes that aren't fluorescent. And I've never had any success with them. I'm sure some folks have, but my problem has been that the dye that is not fluorescent is a reddish color. And what color is copper? Not a reddish color. Uh-huh. So I don't, you know, maybe it's me, but I never could see the dye. But with the fluorescent uh, dyes, I mean, it'll, it'll jump out and show it to you when you hit it with that light. Uh, 